Well, good morning. We're, we're glad that you're here with us today. We've been, uh, we've been digging into what the Bible has to teach us about that all-important concept of grace. And uh, we've been focusing the last few weeks on a well-known parable of Jesus, the parable that we usually call the parable of the prodigal son. I think most of us are familiar with the story, uh, a story that, like we said last week, is actually very contemporary, a, a story about broken relationships, a story about a son who, uh, like so many of us, was on a was on a self-destructive search uh, among the wrong people and in the wrong places for what could only ultimately be found in the, in the house of its father. As we've noted, uh, the parable has three main characters, the younger son, the older son, and the father. And, and last week we focused primarily on the younger son, but today we're going to kind of shine the spotlight a little more on the father in the story. Um, although we usually call this the parable of the prodigal son, we could probably equally well call it the parable of the loving father. In fact, you know, we, we have identified that word prodigal so much with this parable that we've actually come to misunderstand the word. If, if, if you ask someone what prodigal means, <clears throat> most people will tell you that it means something like wayward or rebellious or something like that. And we've come to use the word that way. It's, it's taken on that meaning because of this parable. But that's not actually what the word prodigal means. Did, did you know that? Look it up in the dictionary and you'll discover that prodigal actually means wastefully or recklessly extravagant. In other words, a spendthrift, somebody who gives or spends their resources without hesitation, with no limits or restrictions. And we call the younger son that, of course, because of how he spent his inheritance, as if he had, you know, bottomless pockets, no limits, uh, blowing it all on wild living, as the parable says. So, when it says that he is a prodigal son, that's really what it's referring to. I'm not saying he wasn't wayward. I'm just saying that that's not actually exactly what prodigal means in this context. But if that's true, I, I, I was thinking about this. I, I want you to think about the fact that as far as grace goes, that this is really then the story of a prodigal father. Prodigal not in the sense of being wayward, of course, like we often use the word, but in the sense of his extravagant, limitless, uh, what some would have considered reckless love. So some have suggested that this could be called the parable of the loving father, of the prodigal father, who recklessly, uh, audaciously, extravagantly pours out his love and grace without measure. That's the picture that we have here. And, and of course, uh, the father in the parable is meant to be a picture of God. Now, before we go any further, uh, let, let's go back to the parable and reread a part of it that I want us to focus on uh, this morning. So if you take your Bible, you can turn back again to where we were last week in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Uh, we aren't going to read the whole parable again, um, but, uh, but we will instead pick up the story at around at, at verse 20 when the younger son returns home. So follow along if you would as, uh, as I read for us Luke 15 verses 20 to 24. Speaking of the younger son, it says, so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. <clears throat> put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, help us today to, to encounter you in your word, that we might know you better and, and follow you with our whole heart. And show us ourselves, too, in the mirror of your word today. And may your Holy Spirit apply your word to our hearts that we might become more like your Son. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, in the, in the few brief minutes that we have together, I want to share with you three things, really. A word of encouragement, a word of clarification, and a word of challenge. Let's begin with a word of encouragement. You know, I was thinking this week uh, of what it must have been like for those who were in the audience that day, who were listening to Jesus but were really far from God, those whom the text just refers to as, as sinners. I think of what it must have been like for them to have heard this story. 
Because the message of the parable is pretty plain, pretty unmistakable, isn't it? God loves and welcomes back sinners. Now, that's not the message that they'd been hearing, frankly, from the religious community, but that's the message they were hearing from Jesus. And that truly is good news, isn't it? Grace, grace is always good news. And as sinful, broken human beings ourselves, we can't help but be encouraged by the picture that we have here of a loving father and how he responded to his wayward, rebellious son. It's a picture of the grace that is available to all of us. It speaks to us of the fact that we have a loving Heavenly Father and that His love, though certainly undeserved from our standpoint, is nevertheless an unconditional and unending love. One of the things that, that makes God's love so very different from almost every other kind of love that we uh, have ever experienced is that God's love is unconditional. There are no conditions to it. In other words, it's not based on who we are or on what we've done or not done. God does not love us because of something. As a matter of fact, nothing really outside of the nature of God himself can cause us to love him. He loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is, because it's part of his nature to love. Now, think about how that contrasts with what we know of love in our human context. Often our love is kind of reduced to, you know, you, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You love me and I'll love you. You listen to the popular music today and you, you hear our culture's view of love, don't you? And what you're going to hear uh, in popular music is nothing but, if you love me, I'll love you back. Or I'll love you for a little while and then I'll leave you. That, that, that's the kind of philosophy that's being communicated today. Caused love. I love you because. Or I stopped loving you because of something. We even tend to do that sometimes um, uh, as, as Christians, I'm sorry to say. I met a woman once, a, a Christian woman, who refused to have anything to do with her own daughter because her daughter had gotten pregnant outside of marriage. That's sin, she said, and I'm against that kind of immoral behavior. Well, of course it's sin, and, and I'm against it too. But listen, if God treated us like that, we'd be in deep trouble, wouldn't we? If God looked at me and, and he picked out one thing, if he, if he picked out one thing out of your life, could he find anything that he might not like? Anything that might offend his holiness? And he looks at you and he says, well, I'm having nothing to do with you because you, you, you fill in the blank, whatever it is. Friends, that is not the picture of God that we have in the Bible or in this parable. Yes, he is holy. No, he cannot stand sin in his presence. But it is while we were yet sinners, the Bible tells us that Christ died for us. It wasn't after we'd cleaned ourselves up or somehow earned his love. Listen, I'm, I'm concerned that somewhere along the way we've gotten the idea that God loves us because of something we've done. God's love has, has no cause whatever, none, outside of himself. And listen, we, we should praise God for that because if there's, if there's got to be a cause in us for God's love, we're in trouble, friends, because we deserve none of it. Uncaused, unconditional, undeserved. That, that's the essence of God's love. And that explains a lot about what we see here in this story, doesn't it? And about the father's response to his wayward son. Now, I know that human nature rebels against that notion, doesn't it? We, we want to feel like we had something to do with it. That God loves us because of something that we've done or that we are. You know, I'm a, I'm a decent person. I do good things. I mean, surely God loves me for that. And we want to make God feel that... May, Maybe, maybe he owes us something, or at least a little bit, you know. That's why some people get angry with God. They think God owes them something, when in fact God owes them nothing. But he loves us in spite of that. I mean, isn't that amazing? But listen, I, I want you to be able to go from here this morning, not just knowing about God's love as an intellectual fact that you affirm because you're a Bible-believing Christian. It's, it's my hope that this beautiful story of undeserved grace will awaken you to the reality of his love in a whole new way. I want you to know his love down here, you know, to, to feel his love, to, to soak in it, to be, to be swept away by it, and to love him back. I, I don't know how many of you, when you were younger, did the thing with the daisy, you know? You know, he, he loves me, he loves me not. She loves me, she loves me not. And, and, and sometimes, if it looked like it was going to come out that she loves me not, we cheated, didn't we? <laughs> Took a, kind of a half a pedal, so the last one would finish always. She loves me. Listen, friends, with, with God, every petal says the same thing. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me. As we pointed out in, um, some weeks ago in our study, he, you didn't do anything to make him love you, and you can't do anything to make him stop loving you. 
I mean, you can, you can disappoint him, you can grieve him, you can hurt him, but you can't do anything that will make him stop loving. That's really what we see here in this parable, isn't it? You can be far from the Father's house, but you're never far from the Father's heart. Some of us think that because we failed God, He doesn't love us anymore. Because we've wandered away from Him, He doesn't want us to come back home. No, no, listen. This parable shows us that wonderful picture of God as that father who stands by the road every day watching, looking for his son, his daughter to come home because he loves him. He loves her. No, you don't deserve it. No, I I, I don't deserve it. But he loves us. I wonder this morning, have, have you really captured what it means that God loves you? Has it really penetrated down deep into your soul that you are loved with an everlasting love? I love the picture that that Jesus gives us here in this story. The father, it says, saw his son coming a long way off. He saw him. Why? Because he'd never stopped looking. He'd never stopped waiting. He'd never stopped watching. Never stopped looking for him. So he he runs to his son. (laughs) He runs. You know, older men in that Middle Eastern culture didn't do that. They they didn't run. It wasn't dignified. To run, you had to kind of, you know, hitch up your robes and kind of tuck them in your belt. And frankly, you looked ridiculous. But this father didn't care. He ran. And, and when he got to his son, he shook his hand and said, you know, it's good to see you. No, he hugged him. He kissed him. He hugged him again. He couldn't, he couldn't contain his joy. And he immediately sent somebody off to get things ready for a party. You know, there, there, there are a couple of things here in this description. I was thinking about this today. But there, there are two things, at least, in this description that we don't generally think of God doing. I, I don't know about you, but really these two things are evidence, I think, of the depth of the Father's love and of his joy on his son's return. Here we see a running God and a partying God. <laughs> That's not how we usually think of God, is it? A running God, a part. Why, why is he running? Why is he partying? Because that wayward son or daughter that he loves has come home. You know, I picture this Jewish father in the parable, kind of like Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof. Have you ever seen that movie? I love that movie. But there's Tevye dancing for joy at his daughter's wedding. Do you remember that scene? Do you know... That when you came to faith in Christ, that it started a party in heaven? That God himself was dancing for joy? Imagine that. Now, sadly, that was not the response of the older brother. But we'll get to that next week. But grace is a cause for celebration, for joy. And you have a loving father who more than anything else wants you to be home and in right relationship with him. And that's only possible. Not because of anything we have done to earn it, but because of his great love and grace. But that brings us to the second thing that I want to mention today, which is a word of clarification. You see, we have to be careful in interpreting the parables. Anytime we use a comparison or a story to illustrate a spiritual truth, there, there is a certain danger, and that is that we try to press it too far. You know, Every illustration has its limitations. So we need to be careful that we don't try to make parables say things that they aren't really saying, either by Uh, making every little detail mean something or represent something, or by trying to draw some significance from what is there or what is left out, perhaps. In other words, you aren't going to find everything you need to know about a particular Bible doctrine from a parable. And that's true of this parable as well. It's a wonderful story of grace, uh, but we aren't going to discover everything we need to know about grace just from this uh, one story. It needs to be understood in the light of all of Scripture. Because I, I don't know if, if it's occurred to you or not, but you could argue that there are some very important things that are missing from this parable. And if we aren't careful, it could lead us to some wrong conclusions. So, what's missing? Well, what about Jesus and the cross? You see, some commentators have suggested that this parable really contradicts Christian doctrine because there is no mention of a Savior, there's no mention of a cross, there's no mention of atonement for sin. And so they conclude that this parable is really teaching a God of universal love, you know, who just accepts everyone. In other words, that God deals with sin by simply overlooking it. Because on the, on the surface, that's what it would seem like the Father is doing here in the parable, doesn't it? He loves his son, so he just gives him a free pass. You know, he just ignores the past. And everything that he's done is if it never happened. Well, listen, it's clear from the rest of Scripture that if we think that grace is just God overlooking our sin, then we've got a wrong idea of grace. 
Grace is not God saying, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just overlook that. We'll just pretend it didn't happen. No. God is a just and holy God. He can't just ignore sin. And yet, as we've seen, he's a God of love and of grace who more than anything wants his wayward children to come home. And he's ready to forgive and to welcome them. So how does that happen? How can there be both justice and grace? Well, we're, we're going to look at this a little more down the road. But the short answer, of course, is the cross. Yes, God loves us. But what does it say in John 3.16? That he loved the world so much that he, what? He sent his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish. That is, will not suffer the eternal consequences of his rebellion, but will have eternal life. You see, the fact is that while this amazing love and grace that we see so, so beautifully and, and movingly portrayed in this story is free to us, it wasn't free to God. It cost us nothing, but it cost the Father everything. So while the cross is not explicitly there in the story, it certainly needs to be kind of understood as being there in the shadows, if you will, as the very foundation of God's grace. Like we said last week, you know, uh, when we read this story, it seems to us like there ought to be punishment, doesn't it? Otherwise, this kid's getting away with an awful lot. Well, the fact is that there is punishment, but Jesus took our punishment on the cross. Grace does not mean overlooking sin. Our sin is paid for by God himself on the cross. So, what's the evidence in this story of that costly nature of, of grace? Well, in a sense, the evidence is Jesus himself standing there telling the story. I mean, why... Why is he standing there? Have you thought of that? How, how is it that the very Son of God is standing there in human flesh as a first century Palestinian Jew telling stories to a bunch of people like you and me? Why is he there? Well, he's there because God the Father had sent him to earth to be one of us and to die in our place. God in human flesh walking among us. God in human flesh telling us stories of his grace. God in human flesh saying, I, I know you're far from home, but I've come to lead you back. God in human flesh hanging on a cross in our place, bearing our sin, our rebellion, in order that we might be welcomed back into the Father's house. So no, it's, it's true that you won't see the cross explicitly mentioned in, in the story of the, of the prodigal son, but be assured that there is no grace without the cross. Now finally, let me finish with a word of challenge that arises out of this uh, story. We've talked about God's grace that is available to us no matter what we've done or how far we've wandered. We've talked about what it costs God to offer us that grace. But this parable also issues a call to us to be people of grace, showing grace to others. We're going to spend more time talking about this next week when we focus more on the older brother. But the fact is that as sons and daughters of the Father, and as recipients of the Father's grace, we are to display the family likeness, if you will, by also demonstrating His love and grace to others. I remember when we first when we first moved here, um, going on ten years ago. Uh, first, we were trying to get to know the people in the congregation and know their names and ma match the kids with the right parents and all of that. But in some cases, it wasn't difficult at all to figure out what family a kid belonged in, because the the kid was like a copy of the parents. You know, the, the family likeness was unmistakable. We we belong to the family of God if we place our trust in Him. God is our Father, and I wonder. Is the family likeness discernible in our lives? Can people tell? Do they say, oh, he's just like his father? Our father, as this parable so clearly and eloquently shows, is a God of grace. I wonder if his children are like him. One of the things that we're going to observe as we look at the older son next week is that he did not share his father's attitude of love and grace, and it was a cause of, of great grief to the father that his son did not carry that family likeness. How did Jesus say that the world will know that we're his disciples? By our love. In other words, they'll know because we act like our Father. We have the family likeness. If we claim to be the people of God, then his grace should be reflected in our own attitudes and actions. That's part of the challenge of this parable, really. Not only that we will learn to receive grace, but that we will learn to be people who treat others with the same grace that we have received. I'm not so sure that we always do that very well. But I'm asking God to change that in my life. Like the little kid, I want to grow up to be like my dad. And it's my prayer that we would increasingly grow to demonstrate our Father's character by being people of grace.
Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, how can we ever express our our gratitude for, for welcoming us into your family when we were far from you, undeserving of your love. Your grace has changed our lives forever. And we want to learn to be like that, to be people of grace. We admit that it's hard for us sometimes to find that balance of standing against sin while at the same time showing grace and compassion to the sinner. We aren't very good at that sometimes, but, but you are. So would you live out Live it out in us by your Holy Spirit. Would you make us people of grace, <clears throat> even as we live in the grace that has brought us into this relationship with you? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you.